Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Charlotte LeBay, and I am the Senior Administrative Coordinator for the California Primary Care Association. Before we jump into today's uh, quarter four outreach and enrollment peer network, I just want to remind everyone that lines are self-muted throughout today's session. We are going to have a pretty packed agenda and a lot of people online, so please make sure you keep your lines muted throughout the session. If you do want to speak with us, you can raise your hand and we'll let you know alert to let you know when you have full audio. You can also chat in your questions or comments into the chat box. Today's session is being recorded. I will drop the documentation into the chat to download here in a little bit. Um, again, just a few housekeeping material will be shared on Connected Community. I'll drop it in the chat. Cameras are encouraged, they're not mandatory. Um, mute when you're not speaking. But with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Yarin to introduce everybody and get us going. Thank you all for joining. Thank you, Charlotte, and welcome everyone to our Outreach and Enrollment Peer Network. Um, and just a warm welcome to our returning members, as well as some new folks that we have joining us today. As an FYI, our Outreach and Enrollment Peer Network, or OEPN as we refer to it, is a platform that serves for the outreach and enrollment staff at health centers and regional consortia alike to exchange experiences, tools, and resources. Uh, while also staying informed uh, about statewide and federal updates uh, with the support of CPCA staff. And so uh, in between our quarterly meetings, feel free to continue ongoing discussions on our Outreach and Enrollment Peer Network Connected community. So as Charlotte mentioned, we do have a packed agenda today. I just want to do a quick run of show of what we'll be covering in our next hour or so. Um, I'll quickly do some quick updates around upcoming training and events that CPCA is hosting. Following that, uh, our very own Natalie Diaz, Director of Health Center Operations at CPCA, will provide an update on the CPCA Navigators Project uh, that involves outreach and enrollment staff. And then we are joined to, uh, by DHCS, um, a couple folks, uh, to present on the Medi-Cal Managed Care Transition, uh, just an overview of new requirements and changes, some brief time for questions. Following that, Abby Corsell of the National Health Law Program, a senior attorney, is joining us to share some roles, resources, and best practices on that topic. And that will put us at the end of the hour. Uh, so with that, I'll jump into the updates that we have, just some upcoming, uh, a couple training and technical assistance opportunities. Uh, I'm not sure why it's not showing on the slide there, but we'll go ahead and send those links out in the chat as well as the slides afterwards. There's really just two events that I wanted to highlight. Our Empathy um, Inquiry mini workshop is happening tomorrow at 3 to 4 p.m. Uh, this is part of our SDOH peer network. Uh, so I'll go ahead and pop uh, the, the links um, just as soon as I finish talking in a minute here. And then on December 19th, uh, we also have a presentation on improving Medi-Cal member health outcomes with enhanced care management and community support benefits. So if you're interested in those opportunities, I'll, I will go ahead and share our registration links so you can get more information on those events. And then I just wanna uh, provide a quick uh, second update here on the next slide uh, regarding our outreach and enrollment peer network chair. Um, so just want to extend thanks. And then Charlotte, we could move to the next slide here. It's not on the one you I have. Oh, that's too bad. Sorry about that. <laughs> this is mainly more of a verbal update anyways. Um, so I just wanted to share some exciting news with everyone. Uh, for folks that are joining us from, you know, coming to a couple of outreach and enrollment peer network meetings or new members, our chair is Saul Arellano from Park Tree. And just wanted to uh, share that he will be continuing as our chair into 2024. Um, and so just a quick shout out to Saul's uh, exceptional leadership. It's really been instrumental, especially right now with these significant strides uh, in the last year, uh, notably all of the work and conversations that we have had around Medi-Cal redetermination. Um, so as we look into 2024, uh, we're gonna continue to um, work with Saul to guide our peer network to focus on building on those successes from the last year. Um, and he'll be at the forefront of shaping our network activities um, and emphasizing some topics that matter uh, most to our health center community. Um, as an FYI, if you are interested in that leadership development opportunity and influencing discussions, uh, feel free to reach out to us at any point to 
provide suggestions. Um, and also if you're interested in being a chair in any of the coming years for our peer network, we'd love to hear from you all. Um, and so as we move into our next topic uh, with, with Natalie Diaz, I just want everyone to take a moment to join me with your emojis or you know on camera uh, in thanking Saul for, for his continued efforts. Um, Yadin, I don't see Natalie, so give me one moment. Let me see if I can go snag her. Okay. Um, you know, we, we can keep it going and we'll just move Natalie to the end. Um, but if, uh, our DHCS folks are ready to go, we can, um, we can move on to their, their piece, um, and just start, you know, a couple minutes early with that. How does that sound, Michelle? Yeah, that sounds good, Dana. Okay, okay. perfect. Dana's shaking her head. We're good to go. Awesome. Thanks for being flexible. No problem. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I almost said good morning, but it's already one o'clock. Um, good afternoon, thank you for having me. My name is Michelle Retke. I'm with um, the Managed Care Operations Division here at DHCS, and then joined um, by one of my peers, Dana Durham, who is in the Managed Care Quality and Monitoring Division. And so we wanted to give um, a brief update um, uh, as requested, kind of walking through the 2024 um, Medi-Cal Managed Care contract and transition. Um, so next slide. So we're going to do an overview of the transition and how it is impacting California. Um, Dana is going to touch on some of the contract requirements and key changes, and then we'll kind of tack and tie those things to how that um, impacts our members. And then there are quite a few slides in the appendix that we won't be going over today, but they're a really good resource. Um, so next slide. Okay, actually, you can go to the next slide as well. We're going to touch on the transition. So there's a lot of things happening on January 1, 2024. And when it comes to the changes that are happening in the managed care plan space, there are three um, main uh, pieces, I guess, that are driving that change. Um, and you may have seen these slides, um, a few of these in other forums. Um, we've made sure to kind of use consistent slides so that we're sharing out the same information. And these are also located on our website. But um, three main things that are kind of changing the landscape of California a bit in the managed care space, um, the new commercial kind of plan mix. Um, can you guys still hear me okay? Okay. Sorry, something just popped up, so I wasn't sure. Um, in December of 2022, we had announced um, what commercial plans will be operating in California effective January 1, 2024. So over the last year, we have been going through an operational readiness with all of our plans, um, and the commercial plans were part of that. You may have also um, been hearing about some county plan model changes. And what that basically means is that in certain counties, 17 of them to be specific, um, there is a change in the plan model that is operating there. So for example, a county that may be currently in 2023 is considered what we call a regional model county where two commercial plans operate there. Um, actually is changing to a COES or County Organized Health System model. And so there are 17 counties that are changing their plan model type. And one of our um, slides coming up will kind of show that in a picture um, of California. One of the key things here with the model changes is that there's actually a new model that will be operating in California and it's called the single plan model. It's similar to the COES where it is only one plan operating in that county. And it impacts three counties, um, Alameda, Contra Costa, and Imperial. And then the third um, driver of some change in California for January 1 is the direct contract with Kaiser. And what that really means is that there are uh, many counties where Kaiser operates today, um, but they operate as a delegate or a subcontracted partner. Um, or they may operate in some other type uh, line of business for Kaiser. Um, starting January 1, 2024, DHCS will have a direct contract with Kaiser in 32 counties. Um, and so those are three of the main um, changes that, like I said, are really driving some of the, the changes that you'll see at the top of the year. So next slide. Um, this is just a resource slide. I don't need to really go over it, but to um, kind of point out, these are the counties that are impacted by 
the changes that I was just going over, but I want to make sure that I'm clear that when we start talking about the contract, the actual managed care plan contract that all of the plans will sign, that impacts every plan, managed care plan in California, no matter what county that they're operating in. This slide is just highlighting those um, unique counties that are having a change. And the number here, um, it says approximately 1.2 million members will transition to a new MCP or new managed care plan. What that basically means is that in those counties where um, a plan is exiting and a new plan is coming in, um, or in a county um, where uh, we are changing to that single plan model and an existing plan is taking over the entire county, for example, um, that is where a member is impacted and where they will either choose a new plan if it's a county where there's a plan choice or they will be placed into a plan um, on January 1 if it's, say, for example, a COS, County Organized Health System model, or a single plan. They'll actually be put into that plan because there's only one plan that operates there. Um, so we can go to the next slide. I think this might be a good slide to share. So it shows two um, pictures of California. One is the current uh, models that are listed there. And then you have the 2024 models. And this just really lets you know, again, the type of plan model that operates. But again, across the state, if you're a managed care plan in California, you are operating under the same contract. And so effective January 1, 2024, all of those requirements will be primarily the same across, um, across all plans. So this is a really good resource to have in your back pocket um, if you are talking about kind of how California is going to look a little bit different in January. Um, next slide. So these are some key points. I had mentioned that one of the um, drivers of some change is um, Kaiser expanding to be a direct contracted um, plan with uh, DH or with California uh, with DHCS. Some people call this being a prime plan, so it's it's used interchangeably. So effective January one, Kaiser will operate in thirty two counties. Um, there are two counties today: Sacramento and San Diego where Kaiser already operates this way. They're already the prime plan. And then there are, like I mentioned, some counties where Kaiser operates um, as a subcontracted partner or a delegated plan. And in those counties, Kaiser will now become the prime plan. But I think the main takeaway is to know that the members that are with Kaiser today will stay with Kaiser. So it's not as though they are moving out of Kaiser just because that plan is becoming a prime plan. I think some of the other key takeaways here on this slide is just to know that there are um, uh, parameters, uh, requirements of how somebody can choose and be in Kaiser, and you may have heard these before, um, but part of um, the direct contract with Kaiser starting in January 1, 2024, there's actually um, a few changes, and they're actually outlined in the um, Memorandum of Understanding or the MOU that we have with Kaiser that's also a resource online. But um, some of the key ways to get into Kaiser, to be able to choose Kaiser as a plan, is if you have any prior affiliation with Kaiser over the last 12 months, if your family is connected with Kaiser, but there are um, also foster care children and youth. They don't need to have those same connections in place. They can choose Kaiser, a foster care children and youth. Um, that is in one of those specific aid codes, they can choose Kaiser without having to be connected to Kaiser in the last 12 months. And same with our um, dual members as well. So there's a resource slide that we'll get to towards the end that will, that will help you link out to some of this information with a little bit more detail. You can go to the next slide. Okay, so we're going to get into uh, contract requirements and changes, and by no means are the upcoming slides going to list out everything, but we tried to um, do some high-level slides that kind of capture some of the main topics. So if you go to the next slide, which I'll talk a little bit on this slide, and then I'm going to hand it over to Dana to get into a little bit more detail. But the managed care plan contract, um, we tried um, with a lot of stakeholder feedback, plan feedback, advocate feedback, um, to make the contract more robust, make the requirements very clear. All of the things listed on this slide really are the guiding um, the guiding items that helped build out the contract. And Dana will go into some of these a little bit more detail, but obviously you guys have been tracking, I'm sure, CalAIM, so things associated to CalAIM. 
um, are in here, as well as um, a variety of other um, new requirements. But some of the main goals of this contract were uh, transparency, um, quality of care, access to care. Um, you'll see some uh, big changes in the local um, engagement area of the contract, as well as in the behavioral services and children's services. So this slide just kind of captures um, some key areas that we um, incorporated into the contract. And then I'm going to hand it over to Dana for the next five or six slides um, to talk a little bit more in detail about some of these uh, contract requirements. Thanks, Michelle. Um, next slide, please. So as we start talking about the contract and some of what we've done, as Michelle kind of said, the focus really is on access to care, transparency, and making sure that um, the individuals who are members of managed care plans get what they need. Um, part of being in managed care is the thought that it is proactive instead of reactive. So one of the ways we've tried to make the contract more robust in that area is along the line of access to care, con continuum of care, and really aligning that with CalAIM. So the managed care plans are required to meet more robust expectations provi for providing access to high quality care. And some of that is helping a member access services and navigate the delivery systems as well as care management services. So instead of kind of having to navigate the system um, oneself, the idea is that if someone is vulnerable or needs help, that there are ways to access that care proactively. And one of those ways is through transitional care services. And those are when someone is being discharged from an acute care facility or from a skilled nursing facility or some other institution that um, the managed care plan is responsible to work on those transitions to make sure that they're smooth. Additionally, the ongoing implementation of CalAIM, and that includes the um, enhanced care management, community support, and newly carved in benefits, such as major organ transplants and long-term care, which includes skilled nursing facilities and ICFDDs. Um, and really this is meant to make sure that the managed care plan is responsible for coordinating the care across those spectrums. And if someone has either social drivers of health that make them more at risk or is in a population that is identified as vulnerable, um, that the managed care plan proactively steps into that space to work to manage that person's care and make sure that they can live in as least restrictive a way as possible. Um, we're also working to strengthen coordination and continuity of care for out-of-network providers. So one of the things that we've done in the 2024 transition is to make sure that as these transition happens, if a person is particularly identified as vulnerable and some of the things that would identify a person as vulnerable is having enhanced care management or being part of hospice or um, needing an organ transplant um, in an ICFDD. Some of those things, we're doing what we can to make sure that as that transition happens, that at least for that first year, the plan can work to bring that provider into their network. And while they're doing that, they can continue to see their provider if the provider will agree to um, a single case agreement. We also are really concerned about maintaining comprehensive networks and providing access to appropriate culturally linguistic competence and high quality care. And so some of what we're doing in that area is really beefing up or, or making more explicit some of the requirements for training that um, is part of what should be provided to every provider in the plan. One of um, an example of that is that we have required um, specific training for EPSDT services. And um, so if a provider treats someone under the age of 21, they do need to have that training um, so that they're prepared to do that in a culturally competent way that really takes into account the proactive care that is available. 
And um, the last one on this slide is providing stronger care management across the continuum of care. And that is not only worrying about someone's health, but also trying to consider those social drivers of health that oftentimes are barriers to accessing care and how you um, help someone remove those barriers to care. And that really is part of what enhanced care management and community supports overall um, seek to do. Next slide, please. Um, so a little bit more about coordinated and integrated care. The managed care plans will systematically coordinate services and comprehensive care management through um, really three types of case management. The first one is basic population health management. And that's available to anyone, even if they don't have complex needs or any social uh, identified drivers of health. Um, someone may have social drivers of health that um, are impeding their access to care, but if someone doesn't know about them yet or they've yet to be identified, that person still is available to um, access basic population health management. So someone could call in and the managed care plan should connect them with an appointment if they're having trouble finding an appointment. The step up from that is the complex care management. And that really is if someone has a health condition that has a lot of um, needs for uh, appointments and coordination of their services overall, having someone who is familiar with what is required and making sure that all of that is coordinated so that an individual doesn't, who's going through a complex condition, such as a cancer diagnosis and needs to go to radiation, and then they need to go to physical therapy, and then they have to get into their specialist, and they have um, to go to radiology. Someone who can help kind of coordinate all those things and talk together, and then the um, highest kind of identification of care management is bringing in those social drivers of health, such as homelessness, or um, if someone is identified as being part of a justice-involved area, or they have a lot of complex needs and they need, uh, they have some social drivers of health as well. Um, we do have a list of those populations, but that's that top level that really it, brings in the social drivers of health as well as the complex conditions. And the idea behind it is a whole person care in a disciplinary approach for populations with complex health care needs. So instead of viewing someone as their diagnosis, how do you work with them as an individual and address the things that are going on that really do impact their health? Um, some of the ways we tried to do that is in some community supports, one that is available in, in many areas, but not used as much as we'd like is asthma remediation. And it is a way to deal with one of those social drivers of health that really can impact a person's long-term health. Um, in general, we're really worried about making sure that care is coordinated better for all members. Um, and part of doing that is through enhanced coordination with our local health departments, county behavioral health departments, schools, justice systems, and community-based organizations. One part of that is having um, memorandums of understandings that really codify the relationship between some of those organizations and the managed care plans. Um, a couple I'll mention, we do have a... Um, memorandum of understanding for the county mental health departments and the managed care plans, another one for um, IHSS and the managed care plans, and um, there, there are a lot of them. There's a list available if you want to know what all of them are, but the impetus behind all of them is that when a situation happens with an individual, instead of having to go to that organization and find that individual, those individuals should be identified beforehand and the processes by which the two organizations work together are to be identified and so that when an issue comes up where that coordination is needed and someone has those needs that someone's not having to go hunting either from the county or from the plan, but they know who to call and that coordination can ha happen pretty seamlessly. 
And then um, finally, the facilitation of warden handoffs to public benefit programs and, and follow up to ensure that um, members receive those needed services. So not just handing someone a card and saying, call this person, but making sure they get in contact with that person and ensuring that the services that that person needs to improve their health are needed, are received overall. Um, next slide. Um, so behavioral health services expansion is another thing that we really have focused on in the enhancement of the contracts and manage care plans are expanding access to evidence-based behavioral health services that focused on really early identification and um, engagement and treatment for youth, um, children, and adults. And that is done in a couple ways. One is through our CYBHI program, and that really is a program in which we've done things like create apps on a phone that children and youth can um, with the permission, if they're a child, um, from their parents can go to get the help they need and really making sure that if something is going on, that that screening is done at the appropriate level. We've standardized screening tools across the mental health and managed care plans so that um, when someone comes and, receive and has a need, that need is assessed and they are taken to the right place to get the right care and don't have to be shuffled from system to system. And then integration of behavioral health and physical health care. And that includes a no wrong door policy. And the no wrong door policy is to make sure that if someone needs help, they're given help, them help immediately and that wherever they go, they can get that help. And if they're happy with their the help that they're given where they are, that if it's possible, they can continue with that system to um, continue to receive that help. Um, and increased access to providers within public schools. And we have worked with public schools to do, uh, to make sure that behavioral health is integrated into public schools better, including a fee schedule that the schools use to um, build and manage care plans. So it's really clear how they're reimbursed for services and that those services are available within the school. The new contract also clarifies substance use disorder coverage and medication assisted treatment services or MAT services across all settings, just making sure that the managed care plans do have the information to coordinate and know exactly where to go and that there are, instead of barriers, there are connections made between those systems and that behavioral health is seen as something that should be easily accessed, should be available in multiple places. And if a need is identified, instead of having to go Seek help that help is easy to identify and readily accessible. Next slide. Um, local presence and engagement. This is something we really um, are really focusing on and care a lot about. Uh, managed care plans will ensure that they and their network providers understand and meet community needs. Um, and some of the things we've done are we've strengthened provisions for member and family engagement and participation in managed care plans advisory group. And also as a department, we've initiated a member stakeholder committee in which we get feedback and react to that feedback and make sure that our policies and the way we enact those policies are actually moving the needle with members and hearing the hearing what's actually happening with the member has enabled us to refine our policies. We also really care about that deeper engagement with local public health, social services, behavioral health departments, um, and that's for population health management, as well as addressing those social drivers of health. And that's partially done through our um, memories of, of understanding. But another way we're doing that is We've been doing a um, population needs assessment at the department, and then public health was also doing one for the county, but marrying the two so that the view is more comprehensive for the plans and for the counties, and to make sure that the plans really have an idea of what's going on with the, um, with the individuals in the county overall. 
So there's been an allocation of five to seven and a half percent of profits by managed care plans and fully delegated subcontractors as they have that positive income. And we are saying that that allocation has to go to community infrastructure development activities that support members. And some of that can be making sure that um, funding is given to housing pool or um, another way that really does help to lessen those social drivers of health. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, and transparency, this is one of the things that we're really excited about um, long-term and really think it will help members know what's going on with their managed care plans, as well as make sure that all of the activities that um, the managed care plans and their subcontractors are doing is more visible and more known. Some of the things that we have, um, that the managed care plans are required to post are their community investment plan and an annual report that's related to that, their quality improvement and health equity activities, um, the CAPS survey results, um, and those are children, children's surveys results. The population needs assessment I talked about a minute ago. Um, the performance of the fully delegated subcontractors and how satisfied people are with them. Financial information and that such as profits and reserves and the memoranda of understanding with third parties that I talked about a while ago. Next slide, please. And DHCS is also committed to that transparency and accountability for ourselves. And so in accordance with our special terms and conditions of our 1115 demonstration waiver, which is one of the ways that we're doing, uh, we're allowed to do some of the um, things we're doing. We're gonna regularly report to the federal government on our website, um, our progress related to monitoring and overseeing our managed care plans. and. Part of that's already happening is we have a report on the implementation of ECM and community supports. And we're also expanding our oversight responsibilities and that includes publishing an independent access assessment, comparing network adequacy compliance across lines of business. And we're doing what we can to make sure that we are as transparent as possible in the activities that we undertake as well. And with that, Michelle, I will hand it back over to you. Thanks, Dana. Um, the next slide, improvement for members, and if you go to the, the next one with, yes, there. I really, I mean, Dana did such a great job um, going through the prior slides. This is really just a recap of many of the things that we've talked about, but really um, kind of how it tacks and ties to members and what they what they can expect. Um, and so I think just in the interest of time, it might be best um, to go to the next slide, slide 18, because um, this is a really great slide that I think um, is a good takeaway. So we have a 2024 managed care plan transition landing page um, that has a wealth of information on it. Um, and we've included the links here. Um, there are frequently asked questions. Um, there are uh, frequently asked questions specific to continuity of care. There are um, documentation specifically for providers um, and then also for members. We've set the page up, you can see here in the picture to hopefully be very user-friendly for um, the community, um, our health plans, um, members, um, advocate stakeholders, and so forth. And so within this particular page, I think one of the main um, tools that I wanted to call your attention to is the Managed Care Plans by County Lookup tool. Um, and on this page, you can actually choose the county. Um, and so I saw in the chat, someone referenced Mendocino County. And so if you were to choose Mendocino County here on this Lookup tool, it actually would pop up and let you know in Mendocino County, there's actually no changes occurring. And so it's a quick um, Lookup tool to help members know um, what is happening in their county. So for a county where there is a change happening, it would actually link out to the notices that those members are receiving. And then there's also um, 
narrative information um, that is written there that explains exactly what's going on in that county, how it impacts the different types of population. So it's a really great tool, but all of these links here, like I said, will take you to the notices, um, prior webinars we've done. And then another um, tool that I would point out is our policy guide. So our policy guide is um, an all encompassing um, document that has multiple chapters. Um, there's an enrollment chapter, a continuity of care chapter, a reporting chapter, and each of those um, we have tried to make it as digestible as possible so that um, folks are able to kind of know and understand all of the different um, kind of changes um, that are happening for 2024 and then how it kind of impacts the different populations. And yes, I will put the link right now in the chat for the tool. So I think that takes us to the end of our slides. And I know we've been kind of answering questions along the way, um, but happy to pause for any other questions before we move on, because I know there's a couple other presenters. Could DHCS put a link to the 2020? Yes. So once the 2024 managed care plan contract is posted online, that will be something and we can maybe take that as a, a takeaway. I know it will be um, posted on our website once we submit it to CMS. And so we are going through the process right now for all of the managed care plans to sign their contracts so that they can be submitted to CMS and executed by the end of the year. So once we um, have that completed, then we will post a boilerplate version of the contract online. Right. Thank you so much, Michelle and Dana. Um, we're going to go ahead and move on to Derek's piece, uh, just in the interest of time and to keep us going. But folks, feel free to continue asking questions in the chat. And anything that we aren't able to answer in today's session, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll be sure to cir circle back um, offline at another time. But with that, I'll, I'll pass it on to Derek. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Derek Soyu. I'm a health program specialist within the Department of Healthcare Services, Medi-Cal eligibility. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. I have a brief presentation with regards to the various waivers um, and flexibilities DHC has adopted during the continuous coverage unwinding. It's just one moment. So as everybody's aware, I'm sure is that uh, Medi-Cal renewals have begun again after three years. We call this time period where states are allowed or have to begin um, the renewal process, the continuous coverage unwinding. And so during the unwinding, DHCS has elected several waivers and flexibilities that help in the processing of the renewals from the county's perspective in processing the renewals and for beneficiaries to make it easier for them to submit the required information and complete the renewal so that we can minimize the loss of coverage uh, to the greatest extent possible during this time period. And so we've elected uh, various waivers. Um, at the end of this brief presentation, there's a full list of them, but I'm gonna, I've lumped them together for simplicity. So we've elected multiple waivers to help with um, counties ingesting beneficiary contact information. We receive contact information for managed care plans through the United States Postal Service, the National Change of Address, and through the program of all-inclusive care for elderly or the PACE program. Previously, we'd have to verify the updated contact information that was provided by these beneficiaries before the county can accept it and utilize it. But this waiver and flexibility helps so that the counties don't need to verify with the beneficiary. They can just take that updated contact information, which will of course help with all aspects of the renewal. We have various income-based waivers. And again, uh, really short on time. So just uh, briefly, these waivers help uh, with the automated process the county does um, to verify income eligibility during the redetermination and when outreaching to the individual. So there's several flexibilities that help just eliminate the need for the county to reach out to the individual to even send a renewal packet. These flexibilities really help so that there's a streamlined process by which beneficiaries can continue to receive their benefits ongoing. There's also an, an asset or reset 
uh, re resource-based flexibility, we elected resources for the non-MAGI-based programs. It's going to be eliminated January 1st, 2024. And so this waiver helps cover that gap between the beginning of the unwinding and that period by exempting all resources for individuals um, having a renewal until January 1st, 2024, and then they're eliminated ongoing. And then we have various other waivers that help us to conduct a renewal when we're talking to individuals and to remove certain processes um, that are in place um, that make it more difficult for an individual to have their renewal completed. Um, and a lot of administrative processes that the counties need to do that can slow down the renewal process as well. And so, like I mentioned, we have at the end of this um, a list of the multiple waivers we've adopted, what federal authority we are allowed uh, has allowed us to adopt um, these waivers or flexibilities, and what uh, are the DHCS policy letters that really go into depth on these. So if you're curious about how they work, um, you can take a look at the letters and see how, how each of them work. And we have two slides of those. So when you get a copy of this, you'll be able to take a look at those and really look at the look at that information. And then finally, just wanted to provide information when an individual does submit a redetermination packet, um, they are notified if they have a cell phone on file within the county, they are notified by text message the county has received that redetermination packet. Individuals can also uh, uh, create a benefits Cal account um, and then be able to check the status of a submitted renewal through benefits Cal. Um, there's a new status bar um, that has been implemented within Benefits Cal that shows people where they're at in the redetermination process. And then just as a brief reminder, individuals will retain their benefits through the redetermination process. So through the unwinding, they're going to retain their benefits until they've had that redetermination done. And they'll be given ample notice, multiple notices to them. And then a final notice of action, letting them know if their benefits are going to continue or to be discontinued. So if they follow along with the notices that they receive, they'll be able to uh, have an understanding where they're at the process as well. Um, so that's it. And again, real brief, any questions um, on the screen, and I'll put it in the chat, is our email address um, for any inquiries related to the continuous coverage unwinding. So thank you for your time. Thanks, Derek. Um, I want to give Abby her due time, so we'll just address the first question that came in uh, from Brenda. The waivers are slated to end at the end of the continuous coverage unwind. If counties do not finish all the redeterminations by the end of the unwind period, will the income-based waivers continue until all redeterminations through May 2024 are processed, or will they end in June 2024? So counties are required for the unwinding to finish processing all redeterminations by the end of the unwinding period. Um, so we don't have any information on mitigation plans if that were not to happen. Um, so far, uh, DHC is, is tracking very closely. So um, we'll have more information on that um, if that circumstance were to, to come up. Great. Um, and if you could pop your that email in the chat, and, and folks will also uh, distribute the slides and recording for today's presentation. Um, with that, I'm going to pass it to Abby. Um, and for any um, additional questions, feel free to um, put them in the chat. We'll try to address them accordingly. Uh, if not, feel free to also engage on our Connected Communities online forum. All right, um, you now have the floor, Abby. Thanks so much. Hi, everyone. Uh, let me bring up my slide. Okay. So hi, everybody. Um, my name is Abby Corsall. I'm an attorney with the National Health Law Program based in Los Angeles, and I'm really glad to be with you all today. Um, I'm going to be going back to what we were talking about earlier with the changes to Medi-Cal Managed Care, and I will be talking to you all a bit about the roles, uh, resources, and some best practices from now as we are looking to make all these big changes in January and then going forward next year. So just a little bit about us. We are a national nonprofit law firm committed to improving healthcare access, equity, and quality for underserved individuals and families. Uh, we have offices uh, around the country. I'm, as I said, here in LA. 
um, and we work with local and state partners in all those states and national partners. Um, and certainly here in California, we are a member of the Health Consumer Alliance and work closely with the HCA and also work with other uh, community-based organizations and advocacy organizations around the state. Um, our equity stance uh, is to that our staff defends the fundamental rights of all individuals to health and staff in every role strive to approach their work internal and external with an equity lens. Our goal is to continuously examine the healthcare system and advocate for health laws and policies that counteract structural barriers, institutional power dynamics, and examples of overt discrimination and implicit bias that create health inequity. You can read more about that on the link. So like I said, uh, in terms of what I'm talking to you about today, uh, I'll be talking a little bit about some of the roles of the players as we move into the Medi-Cal managed care transitions. I'll be sharing some ideas about best practices and then leaving you with some resources and hopefully answering some questions along the way. So in terms of roles, um, obviously uh, the big one is the plans and this should sound familiar from the presentations from DHCS a little while ago. Uh, you'll have some plans staying the same, some plans that are exiting, uh, either exiting Medi-Cal completely or leaving Medi-Cal in certain counties, um, some new plans coming in, and then Kaiser shifting into a direct contract role in many counties. Providers, and, and this is what I expect you all might be particularly interested in, um, if you haven't already, this is the time to be evaluating contract relationships um, with all of those different plans that we just mentioned. Um, and then also looking at your patient population and trying to understand how your patient population will be impacted by the changes um, and if, if anything is necessary to ensure continuity of care, um, if your relationship with the, the plan options might be changing. Um, and then for beneficiaries, uh, as you heard, beneficiaries in many counties will have to change plans, and that can mean disruptions to their provider relationships and continued access to care. We'll talk about that more when we talk about some best practices. Um, in other counties, people will have the, the choice to change plans if they want to. Um, so that will be something that people will have to evaluate as well. Um, in addition, we'll have some people enrolling in a plan for the first time starting in January, and that's always exciting. Uh, and we also have Kaiser accepting default enrollments for the first time. Um, so that will be another change where we'll have people who don't necessarily have that prior link to Kaiser uh, in counties uh, coming into Kaiser through default enrollments. Um, and then there's people like me, advocates and helpers. Uh, we have our role to play here too. Uh, healthcare options, which is the managed care enrollment vendor will be the, the main point of contact for many people to help them understand what their plan options are and how to enroll. Of course, uh, a lot of support from people in the community, including community health workers, promotores, other CBOs, uh, case and care managers, uh, and all of those uh, community-based uh, workers and, and advocates will be helping to provide information to people about their options um, and providing people with assistance if, if necessary. Um, and then you also have legal advocates who provide assistance with the most complex cases um, and, and situations where people need to file a grievance or an appeal. All right, so let's talk a little bit about some best practices. Uh, knowledge is power. Um, that's why you're all here, right? So you've already learned a lot. <laughs> um, I think my my takeaway for you is to think about, you know, your specific situation wherever you are to understand what are the plans that are leaving your county, what plans might be newly entering your county, um, is your county changing to a different model? Um, so those are three questions to make sure you know the answer to. Uh, and then if there are any changes to the plans in your county, I think for providers, uh, as I mentioned before, you wanna think about, are you contracted with those incoming plans? And if not, uh, how are you going to make sure that any of your current patients um, have the, whatever is set up for them to be able to transition to new providers or to continue seeing you for continuity of care? Uh, and for beneficiaries, it's really looking at these same questions from, from the different perspective, but, but trying to understand what are the providers you regularly see? Do they have a relationship with the, the incoming plans in your county? Will you need to select a new plan? Do you have any upcoming appointments that might be impacted? Do you have a provider that 
will not be part of the new plan you want to continue to see such that you need to request continuity of care. So it's sort of a series of questions for people to be thinking through um, to understand how any plan changes might, might be affecting them. For model changes, um, a few other things to think about. For those of you who are in counties that will be becoming a county organized health system or Coes County uh, for the first time, um, to be aware that uh, enrollees in Coes plans won't have access to DMHC complaints or independent medical review, with the exception that they will still have those if they're enrolled in direct contracted Kaiser. Um, but certainly if you are in a county um, and you're used to assisting people with filing a IMR or complaint if something goes wrong, good to be aware that that option is no longer available for people who are enrolled in a COES plan. Um, also good to know if you are in a county that is moving to either a COES or single plan model, uh, medical exemptions for managed care enrollment are no longer available. So if you have been assisting beneficiaries in fee-for-service Medi-Cal to remain in fee-for-service, uh, Medi-Cal through the medical exemption process, be aware that that process is not available in COs and single plan counties. Um, and even for people who currently have a medical exemption in place, if they are moving, if their county is moving to a COs or single plan model, they will no longer be able to access that medical exemption in 2024, and they'll have to enroll in a plan um, with all of the implications of that. Um, and then Going to the exception I mentioned earlier, in Coast counties where there will be a Kaiser Direct contract added along with the Coast plan, uh, the Kaiser enrollees will have access to DMHC complaints and IMR. Um, that's a little bit of a change. Now, if you are, for example, in Orange County and you are enrolled in Kaiser that is subcontracted through CalOptima, uh, even though Kaiser is usually an Oxkeen licensed plan because it fell under the Coast plan there, no access to DMHC, um, but that will change now that there is the direct DMHC, uh, excuse me, the direct contract with DHCS. Um, so people in those plans will have access to DMHC. Um, okay, so just a note about people with medical exemptions, uh, building on what I mentioned before. In case you don't know what I'm talking about when I say medical exemption, a medical exemption request or MER is available to people who are required to enroll in a managed care plan in a two plan or GMC county when they have a complex uh, condition, including the third trimester of pregnancy. And it allows people to stay in fee-for-service Medi-Cal for up to 12 months to continue care with fee-for-service providers who don't participate in any of their plan options. Um, and that 12 months can be renewed. Uh, denial of a medical exemption request is treated automatically as request for continuity of care with those providers. Um, so like I said before, because MERS aren't available in COs and single plan counties, people who currently have a medical exemption in those counties will have to enroll in a plan. Um, they should automatically receive continuity of care for the providers they have a medical exemption to see. Um, but I just want you all to be aware because by definition, these are folks who have complex conditions. Uh, they really should be working with their plan now to ensure that there's no disruption to their care and, and everything is in place when they make that transition in January. A few other things uh, in terms of some best practices, network adequacy, as I'm sure you all know, all medical Medi-Cal plans uh, are subject to network adequacy requirements. Those include provider patient ratios they have to meet, geographic access standards, meaning they have to ha make providers available with certain times or distances, timely access standards, meaning you only have to wait a certain amount of time for various appointments, language access and disability access. Um, and I've included more some links where you can get the, more, the specifics on those requirements if you want to dig into them more. Um, but I think that's just something to be aware of when there are plan changes in your county. Make sure you are working with those incoming plans to ensure that network adequacy is still in place. Again, for providers, this is really about making sure you know what your contract relationship is with any new plan. And if you're providing something essential and you won't, you're not planning to contract with one or more of the new plans coming into your county, you know, making sure that either that service will be available through some other providers, um, thinking about whether you will accept single case agreements in situations where there is no other provider of that service available. So just some things to think through. 
Um, and similarly for beneficiaries, thinking about the range of services you'll need, uh, what, the, what providers will be available through your new plan, and what else do you need to do to make sure you have access to the services that you'll need. I've mentioned continuity of care a couple times, and, and I think my uh, colleagues from DHCS also talked a little bit about continuity of care. Uh, so I won't spend a lot of time on it, but um, as you probably know, there are requirements that new plans provide continuity for most covered benefits. So plans must allow people 12 months of continuity of care with certain out-of-network providers and up to 24 months uh, for certain types of residential facilities. There's also enhanced continuity of care for special populations who are changing plans. Um, and the bottom line is that plans should be working with enrollees to ensure that any upcoming appointments, access, ongoing access to durable medical equipment or supplies is not disrupted. And again, links down there for more information about those requirements. So if there are changes in your county, again, this is an opportunity to work with the incoming plans for providers um, to think about whether if you won't be contracting with plans, how you will arrange for that continuity of care with your patient population. And similarly for beneficiaries, if, you, uh, are work, if you're seeing a provider who is not uh, going to be participating in one of the new plans in your county, um, making sure that, that you have what is necessary in place uh, to either transition to a new provider or to set up continuity of care to see your out-of-network provider. So just some resources um, for individuals, uh, beneficiaries, uh, healthcare options, I mentioned before, um, has will have information about the plans and models available in your county and also be able to help people uh, with enrollment, re enrolling in plans, any kind of case managers, community health workers, other types of community-based organizations, um, are available to help people understand the changes and request continuity of care. For beneficiaries, your new plan uh, should also be able to help you with continuity of care and ensuring that you have access to upcoming appointments, identifying new providers, and providers uh, will have information about what plans they participate in um, and can help with, with continuity of care as, not, as needed. Um, if you need more help, like you have a request for continuity of care that was denied, or you're having a problem accessing needed care or a provider, a couple resources, the Health Consumer Alliance, which I mentioned earlier, is a statewide network of legal services providers who give free legal assistance to help people who are struggling to either get or maintain their health coverage and resolve problems with their plans. Our information is there. Also, our colleagues at Disability Rights California, which is the agency designated under federal law, to protect and advocate for the rights of Californians with disabilities. Um, and their info is there on the screen as well. And then just some written resources uh, for you all to take a look at later. Uh, we have a fact sheet on the delivery system changes uh, this year and next year. Also an updated fact sheet on continuity of care that we just put out last month that, that goes into the nitty gritty of continuity of care requirements. Uh, there's a more consumer-oriented fact sheet on Medi-Cal managed care that might be helpful. Disability Rights has a fact sheet on medical exemption requests, if that's an issue that's coming up for people. Um, and then some of the DHCS uh, resources that I think DHCS already mentioned earlier. So I think I have like one minute left for questions, um, if anybody has them, and I'll leave it there. Thank you, Abigail. And that is, um, you are a rock star in terms of time and wrapping up. <laughs> um, so what we're going to do now with two minutes left, we have a quick update internally on our patient navigators grant. Uh, so I want to give Natalie um, the last minute or so to provide that update. But for folks, um, our guest speakers, as well as attendees, um, you know, we we do wrap up at two, so feel free to drop off. But if folks are available to stay on for additional questions, uh, we'll we'll keep the meeting open and we'll distribute that recording after the fact. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, for folks that aren't able to stay on, uh, we also encourage you to um, keep the conversation going on our Connected Communities platform. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass it to Natalie, who will wrap us up, and then we'll see uh, who's available to stay on after for any additional questions. 
great. Thank you so much, Eddie. And good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. I'm Natalie Diaz. I'm the Director of Health Center Operations here at CPCA, also the project lead for the CPCA Medi-Cal Health Navigators Project. And in case you haven't heard of what that project is, um, it is a project where, that we are leveraging um, in collaboration with DHCS to provide what are essentially $20 million by way of state and federal funds to health centers and consortia for uh, navigation services. So CBCA is partnering with the HTS and we are serving as a third party administrator of these funds. And over the last several months have gone through a pretty uh, robust uh, application process, a two part process. And we have concluded that application process and have submitted our funding recommendations over to DHCS. Uh, many of you may likely be affiliated with some of those uh, uh, organizations. And if so, we've been in contact with you about submitting and receiving work plans and budget plans. Uh, but uh, we are really excited because you know we're gonna start soon to commence our subcontracting process. And so once that is complete, we are going to be kicking off the project in January, um, which at that point we will be announcing who all our subcontracts are. Um, it actually is gonna touch a, a pretty broad network, which we're really excited about, really looking at about 10 consortia and about 113 health centers um, that will be funded through this project. So really great news. Um, we know, however, that there are there is much greater need out there. Unfortunately, we were not able to fund all applicants that had applied, but what I think that demonstrates is a really strong interest and lots of uh, excited energy around this work. And so with that, we'll continue to do some advocacy on our end to try to see how we can uh, promote future opportunities like this. Um, so in terms of you know, other quick details that I wanna share because it will apply directly to this group at large, um, I did want to share, you know, as we prepare for the project to kick off in January, Yetin and I are in very, very close um, communication about how we set up the training and the technical assistance around this project. And given that there's a lot of, you know, there's some infrastructure set up by way of this peer network, work that she's already doing in the space for outreach and enrollment, um, we will be leveraging this group, the Outreach and Enrollment Peer Network, in the new year as a way to convene um, health centers at large and CPCA navigators, subcontractors, bring us all together to create a shared space for peer learning. And so, um, you know, excited to, to bring in uh, a larger group and have those robust discussions in the new year. Um, with that too, we are also looking at how else can we get information out there? A lot of really, really detailed information today, which is going to be very helpful going into the new year. Um, and so we're looking at, well, how can we get that information out to our groups? We are going to be developing uh, what we're calling, at least loosely right now, our Navigator newsletter, um, which is going to be going out to deliver some of those really important information um, around the Medi-Cal program at large, any kind of changes, um, you know, resources, things like that. Um, to the larger group, subcontractors and non-subcontractors, but we'll also leverage it as a um, perhaps in a small in a section of the newsletter to also deliver information to that is and that is specific to the subcontractors of the Navigator project. Um, so you know the the peer network and this Navigator newsletter that I'm talking to you about are going to be two critical pieces that this group will see alongside our Navigator subcontractors. Um, our subcontractors will have additional meetings and office hours that we're going to host um, to help them and talk about specifics around funding, around deliverables and reporting. So for those of you who are with the health center that we are subcontracting with or with a consortia, I know that there will be um, a lot more set up for you in the new year. And we're going to communicate all of those details come the kickoff meeting that we are hosting in January for the subcontractors. So um, yeah, I will leave it at that. I know that was quite a bit of information, uh, but if folks have questions, we do have a healthnavigators at cpca.org email addresses. You feel, feel free to contact us by way of that, email Yadin or myself. 
whatever works for you. Um, we will uh, make sure to respond as quickly as we can. And i um, happy to take any questions if there are any for me. Thanks, Natalie. Um, and just want to extend thank you to our speakers for today as well. Um, Abigail is joining us until about 2.10. Uh, so if folks have any um, burning questions, we have about five minutes left. I do see Jasmine's had her hand up. Uh, so go ahead, Jasmine. Hi, good afternoon. Um, actually, I had placed this question earlier. Um, I'm not sure if she would be the right person, but my question was regarding the Medi-Cal expansion that's taking effect 1-1. One, one. Um, so right now we we have, you know, our My Health LA patients, and obviously we'd like to uh, retain them as patients. So we're offering them assistance with selecting their plan and selecting their PCP assignments and all of that. So uh, my question is, I understand that as of 12-1, um, members are able to select their uh, plan and their PCP uh, through the managed care online system. Um, do, what is the cutoff date? I heard it was the 22nd, but I didn't get like a, a confirmed answer. What's the cutoff date for an effective date of 1-1? One, one? I would have to defer to DHCS on that. It's usually around the 20th of the month, so 22nd sounds right to me, um, but I don't, I don't wanna say that with 100% certainty, so we would need someone from DHCS to confirm that. Okay, um, and this is probably a, a question for DHCS as well, but um, so if consumers don't select their plan in December, once their uh, Medi-Cal um, goes full scope on 1-1, one, one, uh, when will they be automatically assigned to a plan and a provider if they don't select one in December? Um, will that be sometime in January or will it be 2-1? My understanding is they will be auto-assigned in January, at least to a plan. I'm not sure about a provider, but again, I would, I would want DHCS to confirm that. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Jasmine. And uh, feel free to contact DHCS directly, um, as well as send that to us if you'd like us to elevate any additional questions for the group. Um, Diane has mentioned in the chat that DHCS has uh, set a default or auto assignment uh, that would take place February 1st. I'm sorry, can you um, expand a little bit on the auto assignment um, portion? Feel free to unmute Diane. I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, oh, she's popped more in the chat. Um, so in case she doesn't unmute, it, it does say if a member does not choose a plan or a provider. Yeah, this is Diane. Uh, sorry about that. Um, so it's never like a perfect science from prior transitions with DHCS, but they have said that if a member chooses via the HCO file a plan provider or makes a partial choice, they'll um, transition on 1-1 one, one if they were part of restricted scope. And if they um, do not make a choice, default um, members transition February 1st. All right. Um, so we're going to go ahead and close up for today. I want to thank everyone for joining us, uh, for engaging in questions and our speakers, um, Abigail, who's here, and I'll have to extend the thanks to DHCS offline. Um, but with that, I hope everyone has a good uh, rest of their afternoon. And again, we'll make sure to distribute these materials to you all via email so that you don't feel the need to have to uh, write everything down and, and um, you know, track down folks to, to get some questions uh, and, and connect offline. Uh, so thanks everyone and hope you have a wonderful December.